Among the deposits in Afghanistan are some called rare earths. There's now a global race to mine those rare earth elements. Special correspondent Kira Kay reports on what that means for the U.S. and others. From the air, the frozen landscape of Canada's Northwest Territories looks as remote as any place on Earth. But in this vast uninhabited zone, there's a kind of 21st century gold rush underway. After landing on the icy surface of Thor Lake, very nice to meet you. Indeed, likewise. I'm met by Chris Peterson, a geologist with Avalon Rare Metals Company. He's out here looking for some very valuable minerals he believes are under this lake. And those gray specks are rare earth minerals. I mean, they, they're very nondescript. They're, they're not sparkly and shiny like gold or diamonds or anything, but um, they're, they're just as important. Rare earths are the elements at the bottom row of that periodic table studied in high schools around the world. Neodymium, samarium, dysprosium, 17 in all. Peterson took me out to Avalon's drilling station, where machines are running day and night, pulling samples from a thousand feet down, hoping to find proof of a large rare earth deposit. And so I these guess, are gray right here. These all are gray of these. here, and I'm starting to just starting to see some of the ore minerals in this here now. What do we have here? Avalon executive David Swisher likes what he sees. What we're finding is that this, the, this ore body is expanding exponentially and it's just getting bigger and bigger and we don't know where it ends. That's the exciting part of it. Exciting because while rare earths might be little known, they are becoming more crucial by the day. In particular because of the very light weight and highly heat resistant qualities they give to magnets. And you'd be surprised to know how prevalent magnets are. This is the new iPhone. They are in our cell phones and laptops. Our military technology depends on them for missile guidance and secure communication systems. Hyundai announced their gas electric hybrid. But perhaps as important these days is that rare earth magnets are an indispensable ingredient in the so-called green technologies central to our alternative energy plans. If you're going to make a wind turbine, you need rare earth permanent magnets. If you're going to make a hybrid car of, of the current type, a full hybrid such as the Toyota Prius, you need a rare earth permanent magnet. Jack Lifton once lived a quiet life, researching and procuring rare earths for the automotive and technology industries in Detroit. Today, he travels the globe as a consultant and key voice in a growing chorus, warning about a looming rare earths crunch. Some people have said that we could be facing a rare earth crisis in the next two or three years. You're saying it could be right now. Oh, I'm saying it is right now. There are a lot of my colleagues saying, oh no, it's in the future, it's in the future. Well, no, it isn't because developing minds takes years and years. The crisis is now. The problem is 95% of the world's rare earth supplies are mined in just one place, China. The giant Bayanobo mine in Inner Mongolia is easily recognizable on Google Earth and is the center of the industry. China used to produce rare earths primarily for export, but as its economy booms, so does its hunger for its own mineral supply. The Chinese domestic economy is beginning to demand huge quantities of rare earth materials. It did not demand as recently as a decade ago. Every one of those cars has little electric motors with rare earths in them. Every Chinese person with a, with a laptop has rare earth magnets in the hard drive, rare, some rare earths in the display. On top of its consumer needs, China is facing heavy pollution problems and is itself actively trying to go green. And so, it has quietly but methodically cut its export of rare earths by 6% a year over the last five years. Then last summer, an article leaked word that China was considering a total export ban of the most crucial minerals. <laughs> At a recent Rare Earths conference in Beijing, leading researcher Zhang Anwen assured the audience his country will continue its exports. But he also told us... Foreign countries should calmly and logically think about this and develop their own minds for their own needs. Our resources are diminishing and we need these minerals for our own use. Jack Lifton was there. Their message is, you guys better start looking out for yourselves. Absolutely. That, uh, that, that is exactly their message, correct? That yeah. they won't be able to provide anymore. As we used to say in the movies, look out for number one. That's their message to us because 
they're looking out for themselves and they are not looking out for us. The surprising thing is China wasn't always the main supplier of rare earths. For decades, the largest rare earth mine in the world operated right here in the California desert. It was very high grade basalite. Uh, and you can tell by the greenish, brownish tint. John Benfield has worked at the Mountain Pass mine for 20 years. When I first came out, uh, we employed over 300 people. This mine was in full operation. It was a, a major contributor to the, to the rarest supply in the world. The deposit was discovered in the 1940s and fueled the color television boom in the U.S. The rare earth europium makes the picture red. As time passed, more and more uses were discovered. America used to be just the number one country in the world when it came to rare earth research, uh, uses, developments, applications. We have completely dropped the ball in that regard. It's all gone to China. Mark Smith is the CEO of Molycorp, the company that runs Mountain Pass. We were operating uh, pretty strong for quite some time. And in the, in the late 90s, the Chinese really started to figure out how much of a resource they had in their country. They had many, many people uh, putting up uh, small shops that were processing these rares and selling them you know, wherever they could get the best price. Uh, but they were flooding markets with these materials. Mountain Pass found itself outpriced and ceased mining operations in 2002. But now there is a rush to get the mine and several other deposits like it, including Avalon's in northern Canada, producing as soon as possible. It's a risky, capital-intensive process, and for the moment, China's prices are still hard to compete with. This hearing will now come to order. The U.S. Congress is now taking on the issue. We can, in fact, be the lowest cost producer in the world, but we do need help in that regard. I have 17 uh, scientists and engineers that are competing with over 6,000 Chinese scientists. A new bill known as the Restart Act proposes reinvigorating the U.S. rare earth sector through loan guarantees and establishing a national stockpile of the minerals. But a new Government Accountability Office review names critical defense systems that could not function without rare earths and warns it could take up to 15 years for the U.S. to rebuild a domestic supply chain. Jack Lifton believes it's all moving too slowly. Are you optimistic that that gap can be filled within the next couple of years? What has to happen? I'm optimistic, but my optimism is fading because I'm seeing uh, a great deal of smoke and no fire. I'm seeing a lot of talk, congressional hearings, bills drafted, but I haven't yet seen a shovel. And then there's the environment. Rare earth mining in the U.S. has not always had a clean record. In 1996, a ruptured pipeline at the Mountain Pass mine leaked 300,000 gallons of contaminated water into surrounding lands. Cleanup cost millions of dollars. This raises a conundrum for environmentalists waiting for the green technology revolution, says Jack Lifton. You want a green future. You want to go on the path to a green future. That path starts at a mine. The first step in the supply chain for the green world is the mine. And people who have knee-jerk react, well, mining is evil, mining is bad, mining is dirty, then forget green. Your world will be black. Mark Smith says Molycorp, which acquired the mine after the leak, is now working with 18 different regulatory agencies to ensure the mine is up to environmental standards. He also points out it is the cost of doing environmentally correct business that makes U.S. operations so much more expensive than China's, where standards have been notoriously lax. Recycling rare earths may provide some relief in the short term, particularly for defense applications which use smaller quantities. But Lifton and others say finding alternative technologies is a long shot because of the unique properties rare earths offer. Molycorp hopes its Mountain Pass mine will be producing about 20,000 tons of rare earths a year by 2012. But that is only a fraction of what is expected to be 150,000 ton a year demand. The unknown here is how much China will still be producing and how much it will share. Without these deposits, uh, uh, we simply don't advance. Even in Canada's frigid Northwest Territories, geologist Chris Peterson says he can feel the heat. It will be years of permitting and construction before any rare earths from under this frozen landscape will make it to market.